there's a danger in terms of self-discipline and training your mind and so on. I think there's a danger to see that as what we would think classically in terms of like training a dog or authoritarian training. What I visualize more is that instead of riding the elephant, you can be with the elephant and by actually walking alongside the elephant and having a relationship with the elephant where the elephant is not stupid, you might say, where the elephant is, is seen as uh, as whole and all right as they are, but they're not something to be changed. You can have a better relationship with yourself and sometimes your mind does run away with itself. The most horrible thing about being neurodiverse in that sense is you know that you're odd. You know everyone else can see <laughs> you're odd. It's not like you don't know. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can end up spending the whole time feeling shame and guilt and, and embarrassment. And, but to be able to meet that objectively as, this is who I am. This is my elephant. My elephant's a bit out of control sometimes. You know, I won't hurt anybody, but at the same time, it might not be what you expect. This is something I noticed in India as well, is that sometimes this, the, the idea of using meditation and stuff to control your self-discipline and to control and to sort of subdue who you are. Some people have got extraordinary self-control. There's autistic people who become anorexic, for example. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. You can have incredible self-control and can be a danger to yourself as a, in the process. This is the Agentic Schools Podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg. Hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools Podcast. I am here with Christine Jones of De Rumte School. Uh, in the Netherlands. Um, uh, if I got that pronunciation right, probably not. Uh, <laughs> uh, welcome, Christine. And what I'd like to do is just jump in with uh, you telling a story about a student or a family or uh, someone who really um, took advantage of the school and what it has to offer. Um, just someone who really uh, got great value out of what the school offers. Okay. Um, yeah, hello. <laughs> um, yes, the Raumte is um, how you pronounce it. It basically means the space. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, person who comes to mind, um, comes straight to mind, is probably Martin. Um, he was actually, he, got, he came around here for my son's birthday actually recently. He left the school this last year. And um, he's been in the school, I think he must be about, he's sort of 19, 20 now, I think. Um, he came to the school as a child um, and he's actually got um, uh, a thing where I, can't, I don't know the exact um, technical things, but basically the two from the two sides of his brain, um, they don't connect properly. Mm. And so his processing speed was very, very slow. Mm. And um, uh, very similar to my own children um, here in the Netherlands, as soon as you don't uh, fit with the right stream, you're, you know, you're not behaving developmentally the same as everybody else in your age and stage and so on is. Um, they were looking at special schools and so on. Um, and somehow they, um, they ended up thinking they, they, they sort of decided that wasn't the route they wanted to go and they ended up at the router. Um, I think this was, he was, would have been primary school age at the time. So he's been there a long time now. Um, you know, basically because he had a slow processing speed, he couldn't attend regular education. You know, he was, he was kind of, you know, basically written off. Um, but what has, what we've seen over, you know, I've only been there a year, but, and you know, he was leaving this year. Um, the person I knew as the, the, in the school, he was, he was, incredibly well dressed um, very very well presented um, very active socially in school very um, well liked um, and yeah he, in a sense he was he was quite in probably quite a shy quiet sort of student but at the same time obviously carried himself well and had a lot of confidence mm. and um, what I could see was he we, they did a thing when he left um, which they do for all students, a sort of graduation event, you might say, where they get a book and everyone sits around and they t and they sort of, you know, talk about what they've done in the school and, and people get a chance to talk about how they 
um, have you know how this person has affected them in their lives and so on. And it was I was in tears. I think probably most of, <laughs> most of us were in tears. Most of the adults around the room were in tears because it was so clear that um, it could so easily have been a case where he would have been you know basically in a school where he didn't really was a bit of a nobody and he would have been a bit slow and he wouldn't really have been anybody um and in the rounder he had a chance to really to become a, a rounded human being uh, uh you know he's obviously quite bright in in he's not he's certainly not stupid he's got a great sense of humor you know maybe in certain situations he, he his brain takes a bit longer to work things out but other than that he's um pretty great you know he's a he's a, he's a decent human being and he, he will be a productive human being later on in life and he has he's decided i think he's got a part-time job in the supermarket at the moment he hasn't decided what he wants to do with himself yet but that's also fine right. um he's got a good social structure he's got a good um community you know sort of communal structure around him he's okay he's he's you know he's capable of going and working and finding a job and if he's when he's decided what he wants to do, he can go and study if he wants to. And yeah. he's he knows who he is. Nice. And yeah, it's just um, something like that where neurologically they might say, oh, well, you know, he's not going to be the same as everybody else. Well, actually, mm -hmm. who is? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, so, so. the 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 school so you've only been there a year um one of the interesting things i like to 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 uh tease out is that sometimes schools um that have been around a while develop kind of jargons and 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 special words or code <laughs> words um are, are there any that that you noticed um at at, at that school um uh sort of um, that, that, that seem like they might be actually really useful <laughs> uh i don't know really because for me it's also a second language i'm i'm native right. english um and oh, i'm right, speaking right. dutch you know at school i speak in dutch you know if, for example in circle meetings and so on so there's this terminology that um applies and you know in a sense it's difficult for me to know necessarily whether um it's a dutch term or whether it's a jargon <laughs> term in a sense right, in, that, right. in that way um i'm not sure really um, yeah. oh, it might come to me by the end of the podcast, actually. Right, right. <laughs> it might actually come up, yeah. Um, yeah. I've had that in plenty of other contexts and situations, and as teachers, we're, we're notorious notorious for um, using a lot of jargon or using words exactly. and like, you know, what does that mean, you know? Things like yeah. efficacy, you know, it can mean three different things depending on the context, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that is an extra challenge, is that the, the you know, literally having a second language. Um, so, yeah. So in a sense, everything's a jargon. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Right on. Yeah. Right on. So, so tell us a little bit more about the school itself um, and how it operates. Okay. Um, it uh, the Ramte is it's in a place called Zoost, which is um, uh, quite central in the country. They have uh, students that come from pretty much all over the place, from Amsterdam or from from the, which is north of uh, you know sort of in the middle. So Amsterdam is north. Ilversum is a little bit to the side, and Utrecht is just below it. Um, and it's fairly rural where it's at. But um, because of its location, um, normally the way that the school terms work in the Netherlands, they're all in. They, they sort of they, they stagger them, so they start with sort of three. There's three different weeks it can start. But the round to basically as a rule will start with the middle one, because yeah, you have students coming from different places, so by always having the middle one. You know, it sort of it makes sense in a sense. I can see a logic to that. Um, it's been around since uh, I think it's about 2002. It had its 20th anniversary hmm. um, this June. It must be two, it must be 2003 then, because it was this 20th jubileum, as they call it, anniversary was this last May. In fact, okay. the um, jubileum date was um, uh, was it World Women's Day? <laughs> no, nice. Which was I think on purpose. Mm -hmm. um and yeah it's the, it, it's the largest um and oldest democratic school now in the netherlands oh okay 
So it has about 175-ish students, I think, at the moment. Um, from the age of sort of preschool, sort of we're talking to, uh, from sort of, I think we can start from about two, three upwards, mm. three upwards. Um, and the, uh, they can stay until they're around 22. As a rule, most students leave by the time they're sort of 19 or 20, I think. But I think the idea is that they're, they're given the opportunity to be able to leave when they're ready. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, depending on what their plans are, um, a lot of, a lot of students don't need that amount of time to be ready. Right, right. So, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. So, so, um, <clears throat> since I'm based in the United States, um, there's, there's, you know, uh, a certain relationship between schools and, and government bodies and, and de democratic schools are usually in the private realm. Um, yeah. Meaning parents are paying for it. Um, yeah. It's in our case as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, 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 um, so, so, so is it, what's, what's, how does Derupta fit into that? Is, is it a private school? Um, the classification is, it's called a B3 school, which, mm. um, means nothing. That's, that's a bit of a jargon in that sense. Right. If, um, uh, what you have is you have, you have regular schools, which are state, um, yeah, they basically uh, sort of uh, their state schools. They can be anything from you know you can have a Montessori Montessori school or a, or a, you know something like that. So long as it's um, uh, basically it's it's a, it, it falls under the regulations and they have to follow all the same standards and so on um, that the government say. And then you have also special schools, which mm -hmm. is a different category, and there are different clusters of special schools that, um, depending on um the what, what kind of support needs support needs they need um mm -hmm. uh, they're sort of uh yeah for example my 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 sons before they came to the round so they were at what they call cluster four which mm -hmm. is a school for students who have behavioral issues but are a, a sort of average or above average intelligence mm -hmm. so that was but they, but they have different they have cluster schools for blind children um uh, or, or they have yeah or ones that there's, I think there's cluster two, which is kind of mixed up. Anyway, I digress. B3 schools are independent schools that mm. um, do not fall into the category of, um, the, the, in terms of testing, standardized testing and so on. Um, they are, they can be set up by, um, I, I think they're sort of set up rather than as a, as a, they have to be set up as a, a sort of almost, as a charity almost kind of mm. thing as a as a, as a, right. as a as a collective i'm not sure exactly how that works legally in the netherlands but it's um uh they call it a, a stichting it's usually um and most schools are stichtings whether they're state owned or not it's a okay. sort of a, a legal entity even if you have a choir sometimes you could well, a group or something like that you form a stichting and that becomes a sort of a, a thing. It has to have a chair. It has to have a certain number of members, mm. and the, you know that kind of stuff. They have to meet and all this sort of stuff. There's a sort of there's a, a legal procedure for all of that. Um, B3 schools uh, are independent schools in the sense that constitutionally they can do what they they can choose to teach how they want to teach. Um, mm. They could be religious. They could be, um, they don't, but they don't have to be in a sense. It could be anything like that. But constitutionally, there is a sort of freedom of education that they are allowed to um, uh, do certain things. But they have to, um, according to the inspection, um, they have to uh, fulfil all the sort of in terms of safety, well-being, yeah. um, safeguarding, all that kind of stuff. And, um, for example, teachers have to be, uh, you know, obviously checked and all that sort of stuff they have there's a there is a quite strict and rigorous um inspection beyond things like standardized testing mm -hmm. um including that they have to um one of the things that they expect is that the schools can show that there is uh, development happening they need to mm -hmm. be able the, the school needs to be able to demonstrate in some way that you are monitoring the development and um, well-being of, of the students 
so that's also part of the process but yeah how you show that when you're not if you're not doing testing and you're not doing all of the other stuff that can be quite difficult and complicated for schools and that is a mm -hmm. that's a process that um it's a, it's definitely an art not a science <laughs> yeah yeah and it's something for the for the this for our, um for the router at the moment is is uh, proving um a challenge in the same way that for example uh, summerhill in the late 90s went through a procedure with the um ofsted inspections right. um and they ended up changing some of the rules and they'd sort of changed their agreements and so on um up to re up to fairly recently the inspection um, there were people who they the the rounder and other democratic schools are pretty much trained to mm. be able to show this is how we do it so that they could recognize what what was happening and how the development was being monitored because it is um and there's been a sort of a new generation of uh, uh inspections and things have changed mm -hmm. and so at the moment this is a whole process that they're also um having to make sure that the school fulfills um all of the needs and um so yeah it's an ongoing process for mm -hmm. the for the router and for other democratic schools um it's a it's a how would you say for b3 schools it's always a bit of an uncomfortable balance with yeah. the inspection too because obviously you know you want to make sure that the children are safe and the well-being and so on is in check but at the same time um yeah, we don't want standardized testing and things. You know, we don't need right, that. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because that 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 is one of the things that that, that my work points at is is um, kind of coming up with appropriate ways that that highlight the ways that democratic schools are uniquely positioned to mm. provide for the psychological well-being, which is typically not a measure that's taken. Uh, in in schools, um, very difficult to measure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's actually yeah. that's the thing is is that it's actually not that difficult. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> people don't know or, that yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, 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 that's the yeah. In a sense, if you if you know what you're doing, it's easy to measure. Um, and I would I would argue that um, based on some of the horrific things that were happening at the special school where my children were before we started at, started at Delancha, that. Um, I would say that the inspection, if anything, has absolutely no regard for the well-being, the right. actual emotional well-being, psychological yeah. well-being and development of my, my children, because uh, my son was literally for 18 months to two years stagnated and mm. was incredibly unhappy. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I tried doing everything I possibly could. I was organizing meetings, doing everything I could to get this, to get something to shift. Mm -hmm. um, I had I had a very good relationship with a lot of the teachers there because I was, you know, in a sense, I was um, the Dutch word for it is a betrokker ouder, which means, mm -hmm. you know, basically a, a you know a pushy parent. You might say, right, is right, another right. way of putting it. But as a special needs parent, you become a bit like that. You know, you you yes. you know you, you have a a different role to a, to a regular parent in that sense. Um, and I had a really good relationship with the teachers and so on there. And and in fact, the teacher said. Um, you know, I think your if your son's just not a school person. He's uh, he um, <laughs> he's he's very introverted. Um, he knows what he likes to do, um, and if he doesn't want to do it, he won't do it. And there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, and, and I, I couldn't. There was, you know, they knew that there was nothing wrong with him in that sense. Right. Um, supposedly had autism, he has autism and ADHD, which he does, I have autism and ADHD too. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and I can see that in a classroom situation, because he, he would, he would crawl under the table in the regular school. He was, mm -hmm. when he was uh, sort of five years old, he would, he would basically go under the table and he would basically slide around on the floor. Mm-hmm. And um, he wasn't hurting anybody necessarily, but it wasn't an ideal situation when you've got 35-year-olds or 6-year-olds that you want to teach, that you've got to get this bit of math, you've got to drill this bit of math into this. These, this and, and if he's just like making Pokemon out of paper, making, <laughs> making, making origami Pokemons and giving them to people and having fun, that is not what they want to do. Right. Um, but yeah, he, he, he was an extreme case of a child who... Um, maybe it was his upbringing, maybe it was his genes, I have no idea, but he 
he didn't do something if he didn't want to. <laughs> right, right. He was he, he's very, very clear about who he is. Um, and um, I'd like to take credit for that. I don't know if I can. I, <laughs> I don't know whether it's, it was me, but um, it, it was exactly what you didn't want to have in a school in the sense where a school takes, you know, in a sense, strips you of your uh, your identity. You're, exactly. you're, you're, you need to be whatever they, they want you to be in the class. And he just wasn't capable of being that person. Right. And, that, and, that's, and so, that's one yeah. of the things that, that, that in the field of psychology, we've really realized that, that um, in general, situations are more determinative of behavior. However, there are these exceptions. <laughs> Disposition yeah. uh, matters mm. a lot uh, under certain <laughs> circumstances. Yeah. And, mm. and in, in, in your son's case, it's an internal circumstance in the sense that his brain is wired in some way. Uh, that made that very clear to him that they're like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to do this yeah. um, because that's how he was wired. Now, as as he has, I suspect, as he grows older, um, he'll become more sensitive to situational cues and things like that because that's well, I think he is learning. now. Yeah. yeah, he's getting, as he gets older, he's um, he is in a sense more self-aware and aware of other people's behaviors in that sense. But right. I think, um, I remember thinking when he was 18 months, two years old, that compared to his older brother, it was like he was on a balloon and that at any point mm. he could just float off. He had mm. his, he had this ability to just bubble himself. Mm. And if you asked, if you told him not to do something, he would go, but just do it anyway. Right, right, right. He's like, <laughs> Okay. You know, and um, uh, my 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 parents used to call me she who will not be told, mm. because mm. I always had an answer for everything. Um, and I think it was it's very similar to that. It was just sort of like you know he, I think he had a, he's got quite a good relationship to self preservation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, in fact, um, I had a conversation with my other son about this about this idea that um, this. The self-preservation that you naturally have as a human being is, I think, sometimes corrupted by school or by if you're if you're mollycoddled, if, if you have if you're protected too much. Um, because I remember as a Gen Xer growing up, um, also as a single parent family where my dad didn't really have much idea what I was doing as a teenager, that um, he made it very clear to me that um, I'm not qualified to tell you what to do in life, mm. which is quite quite an odd thing even for Gen X generation to have a parent that will just say well I am not qualified to tell you what to do in life mm -hmm. it's up to mm -hmm. you um, and so as a result I became um, much more responsible and self-aware for example if I went to parties and things I knew I had to get myself home yeah. and and so when whereas my friends were, were getting into, were having more problems with alcohol and drugs for example um, not to say that I didn't do them, but um, I knew I had to get myself home. Right, right. And so I had a much more, um, my sense of self-preservation was much stronger. And I think that um, Ruben has got, even though he does his own thing, he has got a very um, healthy sense of self-preservation. Mm. But it's not it's not based on what he's told to do. It's based on what he thinks. Right, right. Yeah, and... Um... And so it's interesting to to think about what school needs to be mm -hmm. uh, when this is the very this is the scale of variation yeah in people um, yeah is is you know is it appropriate to think of it as a place particularly when they're young small um, is sometimes school people think of it as a place for uh, teaching self-preservation and, and, and sort of imparting things to the child, um, mm. which isn't 100% incorrect, but how correct is it when you have this different, very different ways that children can come into the situation with those sensibilities? Um, mm. Should it, yeah, anyway, it, it, it's uh, <clears throat> one of the challenges. Of a free, in terms of free range schools where, where students are, are encouraged to learn uh, and work things out for themselves, um, right. that um, 
in our in in the, the sort of current climate in society nowadays is this is a i think children are cared for and protected a lot more um and driven around and and um and okay. have things done for them they're they're, they're you know the parents are like a, they're like little assistants you know <laughs> do everything yeah, for them, make sure yeah. everything happens <laughs> and um and i think that that can be actually in the long term as adults that what, what's going to happen when they haven't got someone doing that for them and right. i think you can this sort of sense of entitlement um can can really be i think it could really be a bit of a problem you know right well that, we, that, that's, yeah. that gets at what there's a certain conception of what children need mm. that 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 presumes and yeah. and as a scientist who studies those things um they're wrong <laughs> yeah. um, because it 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 um de-emphasizes their ability to make decisions and and be empowered to operate in a certain way in the world um mm. Whereas what that does is it takes away some of the autonomy. It may yeah. emphasize relatedness in a certain way, um, although it's not consistently the kind of relatedness that may be most beneficial, um, mm. because it's it's emphasizing a very close, you know, uh, uh, independent of whether the child wants it or not, there's a close, close um, tie to the parents. Um, that 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 may may not be as beneficial to the child as the parent thinks it is um just because they're they're you know constantly with them to get them to different things and and, and managing mm. their life in a certain way um is that is that the is it really the form of relatedness that really enables the child to feel like they're they're growing in their in their social situations and things like that um, if mm. they're not choosing the situation they're put into, is that really the 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 best way to, for them to to like the best yeah, reason for them to be in that situation? Yeah. They might not um, even realise that they're only doing it to police them, or that they're, they're doing it because they think that's what they you know that's expected of them. For example, right, expectations. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So so it's yeah. it's there. There's some pretty interesting assumptions that most parents have not even thought about um, mm -hmm. uh, that go into why they're doing things the way they're doing it. It's sort of like you say, it's, it's, it's a social pattern, um, mm -hmm. which means not every parent is making a, a, a fully cognizant choice about what it is because they haven't necessarily considered what the alternatives would be. Um, uh, and, and so, it, you know, there's a generational sort of where there's a reaction mm -hmm. against being abandoned to something and mm. then there's then yeah. there's sort of some fears about what what it means to be in a this what is the situation of childhood today is it truly dangerous well no uh, uh that, that's objectively not true mm. but that's still the parents perceptions aren't driven by you know a uh, reality they're driven by media perceptions and, and you know th mm. there's there's some challenges in the whole thing um and 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 my way of looking at it is is there's Education has to come down to a relationship to reality. Now, we all have some distance from reality just because human beings are inherently wired to not directly deal We fill in the gaps reality. ourselves. Yeah. 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 We, we fill in the gaps yeah. ourselves, and that is not that no one has, is in touch with reality. It's not possible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've figured that out. Mm -hmm. And so the question is not delusional or not delusional. The question is, how delusional <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah to what degree and and mm. that's where our media landscape can be very challenging mm. because it can spin itself off into unrealities without mm. the people doing it and the people consuming it realizing that's what's happening um, i think this is one of the reasons why we, we've got we've what we cycled back around in the 1970s after um you know we, we, there was a one you know primary school when I was in school in the 1970s was um, heading towards more like the sort of summer hill model of um, letting you know student led learning was letting right. children do what they want to do kind of thing um, and then due to other you know inequalities and so on it's it spiral back towards the sort of controlling 
idea that everyone needs to be tested um, and with good intentions, but the assumption being that that by having everybody do the same thing, that you're making it more equal and more egalitarian. Right. And it's always with good intentions, um, but also the assumption of that this is care, that this is um, that uh, you're protecting them. Like uh, um, suddenly occurred to me, I was I said I was discussing this with my with my son who's seventeen. Um, about the difference between how I was brought up and how my husband was brought up. He went mm. to, um, his parents were very working class and he was the first to go to university and um, he was, his his mum literally worked her life in a sense while he, you know, to send them to private school and he went on to university and he had everything that they didn't have. Mm. And this sort of, uh, um, but then at university, he, um, just like all those other other sort of like very well well brought up university kids drunk far too much alcohol mm. and buggered his liver and he's not an alcoholic or anything like that but he has damaged his liver which went on to have other problems mm. and i think his mm -hmm. his his relationship to danger he considers himself to be a very safe responsible person but clearly not when it came to university <laughs> whereas right, right. for me i didn't have that my my dad said my both my parents were teachers and they both were like we're not qualified to tell you what to do with your life. We know what you're like, a bit like my son. Mm -hmm. We can't tell you what to do. We've seen what you're like. You don't listen. <laughs> We're right. going to have to just let you do what you do. You do you, and we'll see right. what happens. And um, so I didn't go through all of that. But as a result, in a sense, I had a more, in a sense, I've come out healthier in the long run because mm -hmm. um, I've had to work it out for myself, and yep. nobody else was going to do it for me. And that's... This is, in terms of anecdotal kind of, you know, this isn't this isn't a recipe for everybody. But what I'm saying is the difference was, I could see that um, if you give somebody everything and tell them that this is what you need to do, then mm -hmm. they're not necessarily actually thinking about questioning what's actually good for them or not. They don't. Right. They 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 trust that the system has provided for them and the system will look after them and this is what they have to do and they can trust that um, and they don't question it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if um, if you if you for whatever reasons come into the world and life and things and things don't fit you things don't work out in the way that you think they should mm -hmm. um, and you do question things um, providing you do have some relationship to reality yeah. in the sense yeah. and I think but most important I had parents who did love me and they both said whatever happens we're here for you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And even though they couldn't necessarily provide um, much more than that, in a sense that because there was this, there was a loving, you are okay, we love you the way you are, you are who you are, um, you have, that's in a sense, I think that's fundamentally more important to your mental well-being, that um, it's not it's not connected to whether you pass your test. I right. think that's another thing that um, I think a lot of um, my husband's, um anxiety was was caused by him attaching i don't think his parents did it on purpose or anything but he had this he was very bright and he was good at passing tests and he got a lot of anxiety from not being good enough mm. and whereas i think inadvertently somehow my parents managed to say you're good enough without anything you don't need to do anything to be good you're right, okay right. as you are and and that's that's where the 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 motivational science stuff that that I study um, mm -hmm. validates what you're saying um, to the degree that 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 what's crucial is that um, what you're describing as your parents doing is giving you uh, explicit agency over making decisions yeah. and, and and but but uh, putting that in the context of uh, a, a warm belonging, you know, like you're part of our, our family, we're supportive, um, and so being very explicit about that. And the way you've portrayed your husband's family is that, is that they sort of um, assumed that there was, that, that, that the system works, um, and, and didn't necessarily emphasize sufficient agency. Um, and so when he goes off to university, he 
didn't necessarily have as strong a sense of like, okay, here's what what uh, a, a clear sense that he, that that he would he derives what he gets from that experience. So he went mm. along with the experience that was provided, and I did a similar thing. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people do. I think it's one of the oh, yeah, most yeah, dangerous things about natural, university, it? and it's great. I think you know, university is great fun, but um, yeah, it can be devastating. Yeah. Well, that, that's the thing is that, that for me, when I when I kind of went off to uh, college in, in at, at, right out of high school, um, I also left college in three years because in a different part of my life, um, basically when, when I after I graduated, I went for, to worked at a summer camp uh, for each of the three years before going off to the college, and and I discovered that there was a different reality that existed in the world where I could be purposeful and fulfilled and, and mm. you know, engaged and, and really feel like I'm contributing something valuable. That was the first time I worked with children. Or, no, that, not really the first time, but, but the first time I was really, you know, deeply doing it full time. I was, I mean, it was mm. residential, so yeah, uh, doing it full on. Um, yeah. And doing that, and then I go off to college, and I'm purposeless and, and anxious and depressed and, you know, having to do work I don't really, mm -hmm. you know, d didn't find particularly fulfilling or, or interesting or, you know, I did it. I had developed skills in, you know, making school work for me, uh, but they weren't as good because this was an elite institution, and I was like, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I wasn't getting quite as good, get, wasn't quite getting by quite as well anymore. Um <laughs> But the motivation for doing it was deficient. Um, and that's what I was trained into through 12 years in, a, in just regular mainstream type schools was that motivation really doesn't matter. You know, you just do the work. Um, and, so, and so having a deficient motivation and then being exposed to this other context where something was different. And I realized, oh, that's what I want in my life. And so mm. I, left, I left the college. Uh, I became a certified professional nanny. Um, and, yes, and that's yeah, what that came about. Yeah. yeah, it's in your book. Um, yeah, I was reading about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Is, is, is that was a shift in going from something that was self-determined from something that was essentially mm -hmm. other-determined. Yes, yeah. technically I made the choice to go to college and I chose the classes. Mm -hmm. But it was a. It was like being on the rails. It was like yes, that was just the next thing. Mm. I it's was interesting continuing actually. the pattern. Yeah. It's interesting because my parents are both teachers, and I, and I, I did consider many times going into education when I was younger. Mm. But um, what stopped me was that um, I think silly things was things like having a tattoo. I got a tattoo mm. when I was seventeen, eighteen years old. And at that point, I think it was actually not allowed in that, you know, teachers couldn't have tattoos. Really? Wow. And, um, you know, I've had my hair every different color under them. You know, I've got blue hair at the moment. You can't see it at the moment so much, but um, yeah. it's usually blue at the moment. And I've had every color under the rainbow kind of thing of, of hair color. And I was like, I would have to be somebody I am not to become a mm -hmm. teacher. Right. And so I wasn't, I thought, well, I could do it, but I wouldn't be happy, and I probably wouldn't be very good at it, and I wouldn't fit in. I wouldn't yeah. be wouldn't be doing anybody any favors. Um, exactly. Yeah, and I didn't go to university because I knew uncle. I didn't know I had ADHD mm -hmm. at the time, but I knew that I couldn't finish anything. And uh, from a survival point of view, I thought I'd need to get a student loan to go to right. university. And knowing that I never finish anything means that I'm going to have, I'd end up in debt and without a qualification. So I, I basically avoided it. But my, in a sense, as a teacher, as a trainee teacher now, or, you know, sort of I'm, I'm pretty, mo pretty much most of the way through it now. But um, I, I sort of started as an intern at the Rounder last year. Mm. Um, but one of the one of the things that I, um, um, you know, one of the questions I have is, is, is what what does it take to prepare young people to be, you know, in a sense for adulthood and for things like university? And I don't think it's what people think it is. And I think right. that there's um, there's a lot of people who also don't believe that what that it's what you know the sort of the mainstream think it is either. Mm. Um, 
In fact, um, when I told the authorities that I wanted to send my child to a dem my children to a democratic school because the, the other schools weren't working, they said they can't go to a, a school where it's all self, you know, in terms of a self-determination school where um, it's all student-led because they have autism, therefore they lack the initiative. Mm. They cannot do that. They don't have the executive functioning or the initiative to be able to be in a self-determined um, school. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. and I think, and I know my boys, and yes, mm -hmm. they 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 have problems with scheduling. So do I, and things like that. It, they, it it will take time. It won't be easy. But I also know that it's that they want to be able to do things they want to do, and right. that they have somehow. They know more about things than they 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 don't need the lessons in a sense. One of the problems right. they had at the regular school was that. The lessons, the lessons they were being taught, a lot of it they already knew. <laughs> they didn't really need. Then you don't need to teach content anymore. This is what Jerry Mint says as well that mm. we've got access to so much content. We don't need to be taught the content. We need to we need to be taught how to find the content and how to how to uh, behave around the content in a sense. How to you know whether or not to trust the content, that kind of thing. Yeah. Digital literacy, yeah. you know. Um, but that that sort of thing in terms of preparing. Uh, young people for the future, things like digital literacy and how understanding how you yourself works and who you are right. is that is going to get you further in university. Knowing, having a sense, a grounding in who you are is going to get you a lot further in university. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then, like I was told that I shouldn't send my my boys to this school because they they wouldn't. They, they wouldn't be able to survive the self-determination stuff. And um, uh, somebody I know um, who also has a, an autistic son, who's also gifted, very gifted and autistic, very gifted academically. And he went to a special school and did all the stuff academically and um, then went on to university. But then the first year ended up coming back home because mm. he couldn't cope. He couldn't, um, he wasn't doing chores in the student house. He couldn't, he, he was, he was, Partly maybe not ready to leave home, mm. but also um, school hadn't prepared him for student life in the same way. And That's like right. a lot of people at that age, in the first and second year, they can end up having, you know, basically a nervous breakdown yeah. because what the hell is this? Yeah. Or yeah. <laughs> turn to or turn to other, you know, to substances if they don't have anybody around them. I and mean, I, I believe that I do think that addiction and stuff like that is an illness. And it's caused by so many things that, you know, um, it can be neglect, but not just that. Um, right. But I mean, um, that you can, school can prepare you better emotionally, socially and emotionally. And that social emotional preparation is far more important than whether or not you can pass a maths test or not. That's right. Right. And, and I think that, that um, looking at, so, so calling it social emotional learning, is, is current jargon, um, but I think it's misleading uh, in the sense only that, that when it's framed as social-emotional learning, it tends to be reduced to a content that can be delivered. Yes, it ends up being something you can teach again, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Exactly, and that, that's, yeah. That's, that's the myth, yeah. that's the problem of SEL, yeah. is that, mm -hmm. and, and this is an emphasis in my, well, both books, but, but the new one in particular is, is we need a more sophisticated way of thinking about curriculum than just content to be delivered. Um, yeah. Is that, that we need to look at situations as having a structure that is a social curriculum mm. in the sense that it requires things of people, of individuals. Yeah. Um, well, and... I teach English, you know, in, in the sense I have a with English, I've, I, have, there, I have content that, or at least I have, a, you know, there's a curriculum, there's a methodology um, that, depending on the student and depending on their level where they come, come where where they where they're coming from and where they want to go, mm -hmm. that I have learnt as part of my teacher training. Right. Um, right. And, but something actually at the IDEC that um, I really saw was how. Um, as a subject expert, um, 
I still have very much a part to play and that my subject mm -hmm. expertise um, is is not invalidated by right. student led learning that right. um but but what I do with the student when they come to me what they need from me um I can be a lot I, I, you know I can be more objective about um actually you need to put in some effort um let's do some project you know project work where there's there is an element of digital literacy with your English it's not just mm -hmm. can you write an essay right. but can yeah. you can you, can you form an opinion? Can you go off and um, can you look at, can you compare these two short stories? I was doing glossic literature last week with um, mm. with the uh, um, exam students where we had the Telltale Heart and, um, mm. uh, and Nathaniel Hawthorne um, short story. I can't remember the title of it now. But these are two short stories, both glossic literature. And I got mm. them. I said, I want you to read them. And then I want you to go onto the Internet and I want you to basically find out who these authors are and what's the difference. Right. In terms of both Gothic <laughs> literature, but why are they Gothic literature? Because they're different types of Gothic literature. Right, right. Um, and so, and if, uh, but it was interesting because um, when we had the lesson and we went through it and we, we looked at the stories and so on, the students were a bit kind of like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. but then the week later, they came back and none of them had done it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, and I realized that it was just that little bit too, it was too, um, uh, yeah, there, was, there were too many steps and it was too right, right. Um, advanced at that point for them. They'd been doing it in Dutch. It wasn't, it wasn't so much of a stretch, but it needed right, right. to be broken down more. And, um, but in terms of digital literacy, how do you look up for things? What kind of keywords? Mm -hmm. And so we, we spent the next lesson going through well, what, kinds, what kinds of searches, what, you know, let's break it down. What, what questions do you want to ask and actually look mm -hmm. at the questions? And that as a teacher, as a subject teacher, it wasn't the English that, you know, the, the technical stuff, it was the breaking it down so that right, they can right. work out where they want to go with it. Right. And, and, and what I was getting at is, is the more important to me is not necessarily even within the content area, but the ways in which those students arrive in front of you as a teacher is yeah. that, that the, the, the nature of democratic schools is such that mm -hmm. there's a different process for them to be arriving in front of any teacher, is that yeah. there's more of a sense of agency in, uh, about why they're there, um, is that the, the motivation is going to be more autonomous and less controlled. Um, to, put it in the dichotomy we now use. We don't, we, we, one of the myths in the democratic education world and most of education world um, is, is, a, 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 is assuming that it's gonna all be intrinsically motivated. That's not true. Uh, it doesn't need to be intrinsically motivated, but it does need to be in a context, a social context in which mm -hmm. their agency and their ability to, to uh, influence how and why they end up doing any given thing yeah is either autonomously motivated or if it's not autonomously motivated it's happening in a context that is so need supportive psychologically need supportive that if they're con going starting something from a controlled motivation point their needs are so well supported that they internalize the requirements of the situation and mm -hmm. then become autonomously motivated for continuing the work and this is one of those subtle aspects of the motivational and uh, as, uh, models that that um, <clears throat> it is 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 even outside of democratic education everywhere in education is misunderstood mm -hmm. yeah is this yeah. I was just I, literally yesterday somebody was sending out I, I can't remember which organization uh, one doing good work uh, in the world you know maybe student-centered student-led something um, and they're saying, oh, let's talk about intrinsic motivation. It's like just, just the fact that they're still right. using yeah. that term yeah. tells me that they're it's not, not on enough. the right track. They're yeah. not tuned into yeah. the actual science anymore. Um, yeah. That was a thing. Uh, mm. that, 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 that's where the field started, was distinguishing intrinsic from extrinsic. But decades ago, they realized that that was not an adequate way of describing what's really going on. And yeah. most important, and even today, even if they're 
you know, shifting their language to autonomous, they're not talking about internalization as the process that, that changes motivation over time. Um, mm. And that's where my work is right now. I just taught a workshop just after, so, so to give a little context, Christine and I met at mm -hmm. the International Democratic Education yeah. Conference yeah. in Nepal, in Kathmandu specifically. And after the conference, um, having met somebody who own, uh, uh, owns a cafe in Pokhara in Nepal, which is the, another big city and a relatively big area in Nepal, um, she arranged to have me teach a workshop. And so I did a workshop on the science of motivation. Um, and, 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 so, and so, you know, my, my workshop is, is really emphasizing that you can change the pattern of motivation that someone has in a given situation with your parent, teacher, obviously I emphasize teaching because that's the context that my work is, um, but really trying to help people understand that one, intrinsic, extrinsic is not the dichotomy we use anymore. We talk about mm -hmm. autonomous versus controlled, but more important than the motivation at any given moment is do you understand how you can change motivation over time? And, and that can go either direction. You can either be supporting needs such that they internalize the requirements of the situation, become more autonomously motivated, or if their needs are not being met, and this is what happens over time in mainstream schools, their needs are not being met, and so they externalize, and so the motivation becomes more controlled, yeah. not more But autonomous. also, you can't, convince, you can't convince young people what's good for them because they will work it out for themselves. This is the, one of the problems with the disengagement, I think, in schools is that um, a lot of, especially brighter students, um, are, are well aware of the fact that that the, the exams are not the be all and end all, and they just want right. you know they know that there's going to be more after that, and that they know that what they're being told is actually not true, and they don't mm -hmm. trust the the guiding adults around them because they just think, well, yeah, you, you think that that's not how it is now, right, and right. and so. And they can end up basically dismissing everything they say because just because a couple of things they say is wrong, then it's very easy for a teenager to go, well, it's all wrong as right. well. Because, you know, like some, some of what an adult says is probably quite useful. But if you dismiss everything just because they've been inaccurate or wrong on a particular thing or you think they're lying on a certain thing, you can, you can get into a lot of trouble too. But yeah. the other side of this motivation thing is this neurological thing with ADHD. Um, is that even though you can you can absolutely want something, you can really want to do it. There are things I I really know this very well as an ADHD person, also with the menopause because right. it makes it twice as bad. Is that you can really want to do something? It doesn't mean to say you're going to do it. That's right. And the difference between activation and um, intention is is actually um, it's physics as I put it, mm, it's actually, yeah. you have to go back to physics. You have to think of it in terms of you need a push and a pull and you need something. If you're, you are, if you're not moving, even though you want to move, you're just not moving and um, you haven't got enough internal motor to do it. So that's where you would use, for example, body doubling um, mm. uh, or um, what, well, yeah, things like working with somebody else or having a deadline, you can use urgency you know, and I've got quite a few really gifted creative friends. Um, and my, my husband said it does a, it makes escape rooms, and his, he works with this uh, woman who makes escape rooms. We call her Last Minute Lizzie mm. <laughs> because she's incredibly creative, and she's now come to the conclusion that she's probably I think she's in process of getting an, auto, an ADHD diagnosis as well now, mm. actually. Mm. But her sense of time and everything has to be last minute, and. Um, She's coming around to the idea that she causes for herself a lot of emotional upset because she needs that urgency, but at the same time, it could be better controlled. And if you understand, it's like you have a manual for it, if you understand how your motivation works, I know that if I haven't got a certain level of urgency, it won't happen. Right. And so what right. I've done with, for example, to pass my exams and to get as far as I have now at university, because as soon as I got my diagnosis, I went... Ah, oh, I understand. It's not me. I, it, it's, it's, there is a reason for this. And I went to university and I've done brilliantly at university. I've, I've got, I'm probably going to, if I, with any luck, probably will pass this come loud. I'll get, because I've got a, an average well over eight on everything I've done so far. Because I love it and I want to do it well. Right. But what I do to get to my deadlines is um, 
I artificially create a sense of a bit of anxiety and, and, and urgency mm -hmm. earlier on in the process. And I imagine what it's like, because I know that on, if I wait for the last 24 hours, I literally fall to pieces. I'm not, I'm not a good last, last minute person. And I know mm -hmm. that about myself. And so I've created a process and, or, or, and I've, I create meetings with my mentors at school, for mm -hmm. example, too. I, I don't, um, I actually organize meetings every, every fortnight with my mentors separately to the lessons to say, because I want somebody to, I want to be able to say to somebody, this is what I've got, this is what I've done so far, and this is what I'm going to do next. Right. And, and that, I will, I will, um, I will share about this, I'll describe this to my students as well, because I've got quite a few students at, in my English lessons, for example, at the Rounder, who are in, a, who have a similar, kind of brain where they're like, I really want to do this. I keep saying I want to do this, but I just never get around to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I can, I can't fix it for them. Right. But I can say to them, yeah, it's physics. You've got to, you're not moving anywhere. You've got to create some kind of push and pull. You've got to create something. You've got to put it into space and time. If it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Organize it with somebody else. Agree with somebody else. Um, and in some cases, they still don't do it because yeah, yeah. Um, even though they want to do it, there's, there's still a kind of a resistance, but they've got to go through that process. And it doesn't make them a less person. It's having to go through those failures and those, having to experience the, you know, what it, who you are and how you work, this is the time to do it. You should be able to do that where you don't do anything for a week and then you <laughs> wonder about it. But instead of being racked with guilt, there are other lessons you can pick out of that if you don't hate yourself for it, <laughs> right, right, you know. Yeah, the um, so so the 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 workshop they did in Nepal. So the 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 one of the key points I make is speaking of the physics of it, um, is that you uh, the one way of understanding where motivation fits in is that if you think of the essential elements of how you turn energy into work, is that you have to generate some energy. You have to transform that energy into some form of power, and then that power becomes work. So yes. the energy generation is where the psychological needs fit in. Is that's how you yeah. generate energy? Is you get your needs met for autonomy, competence, and relatedness? Yeah. And beneficence fits in there too a little bit. Um, and then that causes causes you to have some form of motivation. However, that occurs, the energy is generated it becomes a form, some form of power. That's the motivational spectrum. Yeah, and, and you've got to create a fuel. You've got something, you've got to create something to fuel it. In a sense right, as right. Well. And that's, where, that, that's yeah. where your psychological needs come in, is mm. it, that you, you, you take that fuel in terms of the situation has some uh, ways that it is supporting or thwarting your needs. So mm. support is better. Support gives you more, is more efficient. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. <clears throat> so, so the fuel is the needs. It turns into energy, which is 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 the processing of that fuel. And then mm. that that becomes some form of motivation. So that's where it's turn. That's power. It's motivation is the power level. And it and could be curiosity. You know, all kinds of things like that that, right, can, right, that can be part of that fuel. Yeah. Curiosity is a byproduct of needs. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so you, mm. this is like the underlying aspect of it and then and then it only becomes work when it's engaged when you engage so there has to be some form of engagement to turn it into actual work yeah something a product of some sort right yeah. right so the engagement yeah. is the key going from an internal process into something in the world that's engagement mm -hmm. and, yeah. and engagement the the engagement that's the most important for deep learning is the agentic engagement because you can have mere behavioral engagement you just go through the motions but if it's yeah. not agentic, which means agentic means putting yourself, your identity, yeah, you're, your you're desires, yeah. your opinions, yeah. yourself into it. That's the agentic yeah. piece. That's yeah. the stuff of deep learning yeah. is the agency. Yeah, I think now, that is the difference between how I look at my study in terms of my teaching degree. To me, I'm doing it because I'm passionate about it, because I'm curious because of all the things, all the things that fuel it. But also um, I got into it in the first place because I felt that there was – I could see that this is something that I could um, make a difference. That's right. 
That's right. That I, that, that, um, that I had something to bring to this and that I could be useful and I could be, I could do this. This could be something that I could be useful at. Right. And, right. and, and, um, but also I really enjoy it. It's fun. Mm -hmm. You know, like a good, you know, there are days at school when you just think, oh my God, why do I do right. this? <laughs> but you know, you know that's, that's, that's part of being a teacher sometimes. But there are so many, there are also days where you just go, yes, this is why we do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, exactly. yeah. And that's, the, but that, um, that fuel sometimes uh if you go into say a degree or something like that and you don't I, sometimes i think university is wasted on the young as you might say almost <laughs> but they go there because they think they should because right. they know that if they don't they won't get paid as much money because let's face it money isn't actually for most people what motivates them no nope, people not. think it is but um you know it, it only becomes the motivator when it's about survival when it's about starvation a lot of very 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 successful people who became successful because they couldn't afford shoes or their parents couldn't afford shoes when they were growing up and it becomes out of scarcity their their main motivation is they don't want to ever run out of money again the money can be a motivator but it's not when you go to university you don't go there um if you don't go there because you've got something you're interested in you go there because it's going to, you're going to get paid better um right, right. there's so much there's so, i know so many young people in you know from doing theater and things like that that they're, they're kind of like oh i used to work in a venue in a music venue and they're mm -hmm. like i'm doing it I'm not quite sure why mm -hmm. it's part of the process um and they kind of become adrift you know right so so the 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 research is really clear yes there's plenty of things that are motivating um, but the quality of motivation it tends mm. to be uh, low, um, yeah. and, 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 you know, money, power, sex, um, I forget what the fourth one was, but there's some kind of the standard, like fame, fame, that was the other one. Yeah, um, fame. <clears throat> is, I know, I know this know, from the self-determination theory, that's one of the six subtypes, was not it? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there, there's, there's, there's yeah. a whole set of, there's this whole line of research looking at, okay, if that's your goal, that's legitimate, mm -hmm. but what's the outcome? And what is the outcome for you psychologically? And so those mm. are legitimate goals to pursue. However, the fulfillment of those goals is less fulfilling. Mm. Is that, that there are other goals that, that are things like community, things like relationship, things like um, uh, spirituality, uh, basically non-material uh, yeah. goals. Those are considered material goals, the, the ones, the initial ones, and then and the non-material goals. Um, the non-material ones are much more fulfilling. Like you, you will, if your if your ultimate thing is fulfillment, those aren't the best ones to pursue. Yeah. There are other things you can pursue that are going to be better, and then the you know the evidence is really clear mm -hmm. on that, and it just reinforces exactly what many age-old traditions have said. And that's one of the things mm. I, I, I emphasize about the, the self-determination theory psychological framework is it's not saying that any of the language we talked about motivation before was utterly wrong. It's just that right. we're being more precise. We're mm. saying... But also the good. implications, I think the implications are really important to yes. for adults for, for bringing young people into adulthood and be able to function and become productive and, and most importantly feel fulfilled and have a sense of identity. We mm -hmm. need people who, you know, we want the, the future generations to hopefully sort this planet out, hopefully, you know. We need, we, we don't want people just to be compliant and then disillusioned. Right. Well, <laughs> well actually, actually we do want all... people disillusioned. Um, well, I mean, we were in the sense, that, yeah, that, yeah, in a sense, they will, you know, that disillusionment is part of the process, yeah. But what I mean is that, that, um, I, you know, I, I think, I had this great start in life. I think as a, as a, as a young, as a child in the seventies, mm -hmm. in that sense. And I, when I couldn't go to university and when I couldn't do that, my early adulthood, in a sense, was, was quite adrift because I didn't have any mm -hmm. degrees or anything like that. I just worked. I did what I could. I didn't understand why I couldn't. I didn't have my, my executive functions weren't working properly. Right. I knew that I was different from other people, but I didn't really know why. And so I was just basically mm -hmm. going from one thing to another, hopefully finding, you know, eventually I'll find what I'm doing. And, but I, I, as I, as I went through that, I became more and more 
sort of I try to train myself as an adult at what you know at adulting yeah and in a sense unlearn this ability to the great thing about my sort of in a sense my hedonistic youth in a sense of being able to do what I wanted to do and I had I, I sort of I I I unlearned some of the most healthy things about my upbringing mm. in my early adulthood, trying to adult. Mm. And if anything, I've come back round with certain things that, like, there's sort of certain bits of adulting that I've absolutely kept, but there's other bits that I've had to re unlearn, you might say, <laughs> to, to feel happiness and feel and to actually feel that I was doing what I wanted to do with my life and being and doing what I believe in. And and you know and this this sort of passion for um, exploring or at least giving giving um, giving space and time to allowing young people to work it out for themselves without mm -hmm. you know without telling them what to do. Um, talking of teachable things with um, in terms of not turning something into a teachable content like, for right. example, social emotional, um, I had the urge to create something at school which would be like create your own manual. If you have a neurodiversity, um, I wanted to somehow create some sort of curriculum, some sort of system where I could allow them to um, to talk about these different, um, the sort of the differences and to create your own manual. And it's notoriously yeah. different, but difficult because um, it's not something you can turn into a six-week curriculum. <laughs> and um, I'm getting so fed up with all the apps that you can buy nowadays to sort of help you with your executive functioning. None of them work because <laughs> that's not how it works. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, and it's you can't turn it into something. It's got to be something that you um, come to in your own way and that you have their own, your own space to do that. Um, but, yeah, that's very hard to turn into a product so so the <laughs> the, the follow-up to my motivation workshop which turned in uh, came through an interview I did with a uh, one of the participants at the the na workshop in Nepal ended up interviewing me for his podcast a video podcast as well uh, on YouTube um, but I talked about the what I call the four psychological powers and and um, now it in that context, because we were, you know, several people in the room study yoga and and have various, you know, ways of thinking about what I was talking about. It's like, uh, so the, the four psychological powers are tame the monkey mind. Mm -hmm. Using the yep. metaphor of a monkey mind from from yep. uh, uh, mainly Buddhist meditation, I believe. But I think well, I'm familiar probably, with that with from the chimp yeah. paradox as well. Yeah, mm. yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Pardon me. Um, so taming the monkey mind. That's just the chatter, quieting the chatter, or, or uh, you know, thinking of thoughts and emotions as simply the clouds that go by in the sky. The sky is always there, but thoughts yeah. and emotions uh, are yeah. the Intrusive clouds are in not the mind. Yeah. Say that again? Yeah. Intrusive thoughts are not yours. <laughs> yes, yes. You, know, you can have um, intrusive thoughts. You can think things. It doesn't mean to say you will act on them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and so uh, meditation practices like mindfulness open up the space between it having the thought or sensation and the reaction to it is opening up that space between them because we come to the world wired with those things together is yeah. immediately baby has discomfort and cries that's useful and it's important um, but over time part of development is opening up the space between those things so that's uh, taming the monkey mind the second uh, psychological power is training the elephant spirit. Now, I'm just using spirit because mind was already used and it's better to have a different word, but I mean the same thing. Spirit and mind are the same thing as far as I'm concerned. But in this case, it draws on a metaphor that um, is common in, in psychology where the we have two minds, the one that's fast and completely non-conscious and it will never be available to consciousness. And yeah. then we have the conscious mind, which is slow and deliberate and you know if you, Daniel Kahneman's book thinking fast and slow he's referring to one mind is fast and one is slow and they serve different functions the elephant is that fast non-conscious aspect of the mind and it drives behavior much f it, it completely drives behavior in the moment mm. now the slow mind drives behavior in the long term 
if it's clever. Um, so if you this is this is the training part. If you train the elephant spirit, mm -hmm. that means you use the 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 rider of that elephant. That's the metaphor. Is that the the conscious mind is a rider on the non-conscious mind, and so when the mm -hmm. non-conscious mind decides to go somewhere, it goes, and the rider can do very little about it. However, riders mm -hmm. can be more clever than the elephant. And so if yeah. they're clever about what they're doing, then they can train the elephant into certain patterns and become predictable mm -hmm. and, and react predictably to yeah. uh, the environment in certain ways. So, mm. so those two powers are the first two. So train, uh, tame the monkey mind, train the elephant spirit. Now the next one is to change the situation you are in. So you're in a situation, can you change that situation to better meet your needs? Now, this is the power of, uh, this is what, the, what um, a democratic school does far better than any mainstream school will do because it is a situation structured to be changed by the people in it. And so yeah. Yeah. that's where, that's a power mm -hmm that is part of the curriculum of democratic schools. Some of them argue about academic structure being, you know, curriculum being only academic. Uh, I don't buy that. Their curriculum is what is required of people in that situation. They're required to participate in the governance of the situation and in resolving conflicts and making decisions. Mm. So they're changing the situation they are in. And then the fourth power is choose a different situation to be in. Mm. So if you can change, if you can choose the situation from the beginning, then you're going to be more. Uh, that's the you know also more powerful. And both of those second two, changing the situation you're in, and then choosing a different situation to be in, those are mm. far more powerful ways yeah. of being in the world than just mm -hmm. training the mind and you know and the yeah. spirit. So, so I think this um, is... with with, the, with that second one, in, to, with, in terms of the, the the elephant and so on, mm -hmm. I think that there's a, there is a. Um, I have a. I think that it's it's um this, to me that there's a there's a there's a danger that people in terms of self discipline and training your mind and so on. I think there's a danger to see that as in in terms of almost as author, or, or you know what we would think classically in terms of like training a dog or authoritarian training and that mm -hmm. what i visualize more is that instead of instead of riding the elephant you can you can be with the elephant and by actually walking alongside the elephant and having a relationship with the elephant where the elephant is not stupid you might say where the elephant is also <clears throat> Has a has a cognizant has a has a has some uh, is seen as uh, as whole and all right as they are, but they're not something to be changed. But you so, can you can actually you can have a better relationship with yourself, and sometimes your mind does run away with itself. This is something as again like right. having autism and ADHD. You know, everyone else thinks you're weird. You can the weird the hot the, the most the horrible most horrible thing about being neurodiverse in that sense is you know. That you're odd you know everyone else can see you're <laughs> right. odd it's not like you don't know exactly. and there's nothing you can do about it and in a sense if you you you, you can end up spending a whole time feeling shame and guilt and and embarrassment and but to be able to meet that objectively as this is who i am this is my elephant my elephant's a bit out of control sometimes yeah yep. um you know i won't hurt anybody but at the same time it might not be what you expect yeah. or something like, you know, or, you know, I can go off on one sometimes or whatever. But the, um, I think that it's, um, I, this is something I noticed in India as well, is that sometimes this, the, the idea of being, using meditation and stuff to control your self-discipline and to control and to sort of subdue who you are, that might work for some people. Some people have got not. extraordinary, some people have got extraordinary self-control. In fact, with people with is it autistic people who become anorexic, for example, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. You, you know, having uh, you know, the, you can have incredible self control and be a danger to yourself as a, in the process. That's right. That's right. So, it's so, not, so it's understand. not about self control. That's right. That, that's it's crucial to understand. Your, it's loving yourself too. Right. Is that that willpower 
is not the answer because willpower no. is, yeah. is is so 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 one of the, so understand I live at a llama ranch and so I train llamas. Yeah. Llamas are 350 to 400 pound animals, okay? If a llama decides to do its thing, there's nothing I No. Can do yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. 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 So, so animal training is part of my world. Yeah. And and one of the things that we talk about here at the ranch is that uh, I, I and I've talked with with far more skilled animals. I, I'm I'm an amateur. I I you know have barely touched the surface of animal training, but I know people who have built their lifetime and have had extensive you know literally their entire life has been animal training. Uh, mm -hmm. This one friend Carolyn in Eastern Oregon, you know she's trained uh, sled dogs in Alaska. She's trained camels. She's trained lions or yeah lions um in safari parks she's trained she grew up doing horses and cows and uh doing you know ranch work and uh, i forget what where she was somewhere in the west here in the united states um and and she still does that um, um so she's an mm -hmm. amazing trainer but she doesn't have any of the language of psychology that i do and so it was really fascinating to uh go out and and i've i've uh she she has uh her current passion is drum is camels, uh, dromedaries and bactrians, and you know she has a bactrian camel named Gus, um, and so you know when 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 I learned about you know Gus, like I'm used to 350 400 pounds animals. Okay, this is a 12 when he was young. He's 12. I think he's 1500 or 1800 pounds now. I mean it's like like elephant sized, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, like yeah, huge animal. If you don't argue with an elephant. It's it's like a car. Yeah, 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 it's it's yeah. it's huge, and and yet, and so 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 my point is that that I have had many many conversations with her, and I'm trying to mm -hmm. discern how how appropriate is my psychological language that I know applies to humans because that's mm -hmm. who it was stu we studied, but I'm like, okay, is there an equivalent some some aspect of animal behavior that can be explained through autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Yeah. This and is the wonderful thing. This is the wonderful thing of, of the human mind that we can think in terms of allegory and metaphors and things and use and, and, and also compare the differences between animal hum, and human. That's right, about what is right. moral, what is, what is actually appropriate, what is moral, what, would, what is useful, what is conducive to actually helping here. Yeah. And exactly. yeah, if you have, you know, you, you don't want to, if you've got a wild animal, there are situations where you can, you can make other people safe, you can make the animal safe so that the animal can go off and not hurt itself. Right. But, you right. know, there are situations where people end up just having to shoot the damn thing, poor thing, you know. Right, In right. Certain, and that's usually because the, you know, the humans messed up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fact, it, can, it can be. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, as oh, far as all the animals be, yeah. that, that we've talked about with, with uh, Carolyn that yeah. have ever been injured a person in fact she was thrown from gus so she was thrown off a camel um and and severely injured um mm. you know we're talking back broken that sort of thing yeah and she takes responsibility for that it was not gus's fault no and she has spent months probably now years kind of reassuring gus that in fact he's not danger a danger to her and you know yeah he messed so, up so not we've yeah. We we have have had actually to, mm -hmm. um, there there was a, a a llama named Jasper, um, that that came to our ranch and and he was just one of the most gorgeous animals you've ever seen. He's he was young at the time, and he was going to be uh, he was brought here to be a stud, and we were going to be his first studding experience, and he was just fabulous until he had that first mating. And then, uh, to make a long story short, uh, she, he knocked down Joyce twice. After the second time, he was shipped off to others. Uh, eventually, he ended up with Carolyn. And eventually, the second time she, he knocked her down, um, you know, her husband went out and, and he went into the freezer. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we didn't waste him, but, yeah. but we did you know, need to, to put him down. Yeah. And that's because of his early training. Is yeah. that he was raised in a certain way such that it, it didn't manifest until after his hormones mm -hmm. took over. But once his hormones took over, 
he was no, we were no human yeah. and 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 uh, carolyn mm -hmm. like i said she had had a lifetime mm -hmm. of experience training animals and and she mm -hmm. could not deal with it so so he ended up in the freezer mm -hmm. um but my point being that we have the ability to uh look at and my my conversation with carolyn is, is always sort of like is there is if I'm looking at these animals and thinking about them in terms of autonomy, competence, and relatedness as needs that they may have, yeah, am I merely projecting, or is there something real to that? And and I've come to the conclusion, and I don't have scientific evidence for this truly, but I think that that there is that those needs are not merely human. I think they may be mammalian, like like all the yeah, all the yeah. big animals that I'm dealing with. Yeah, is, and particularly llamas and camels. <clears throat> mm. I think any it, young, like for example, the way that cats, any any young any mammal, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, needs, needs affection. You know, and um, affection is part of the. Uh, of, uh, you know, you, you need affection to become a healthy adult. Right. right. There, there are studies of rats yeah. where if, if the mother yeah. licks them enough, they become they have better mm. skills as a as a rat than yeah. if they do. So relatedness is easy. Um, mm -hmm. It's the autonomy piece and the competence piece that are actually more tricky, particularly the autonomy one, because uh, because that's the one where being very scientifically careful is like, what do I mean by autonomy if I don't mm -hmm. have the like the way that we assess autonomy in humans is literally self-report. And so yeah. we don't have the equivalent in animals. Um, mm -hmm. However, my experience with animals of and particularly big animals where this is super important is that if they don't have a sense of autonomy, then you're not going to have a cooperative animal. Yeah. Um, I watch some. I, I watch a variety of uh, animal training. <clears throat> pardon me. Two channels on a, on YouTube. Uh, one of them called Bird Tricks, uh, which I find really entertaining. Um, is mm -hmm. they talk about permission-based training. Is that a human is much bigger than a parrot? Now parrots have weapons, <laughs> claws mm -hmm. and beaks. However. Um, because we're bigger, there's a lot more influence, a certain type of influence that we have. And so people who work with birds can bully them into submission. Mm. But what the bird tricks people in particular emphasize is not to do that, is that you're generating yeah. a certain type of relationship and it's not a relationship mm. that's going to be the yeah. best possible relationship for either yeah. the bird or the human. Um, but also, there's the other extreme of that is, for example, my dad, um, he had, he, he always has cats, um, but he mm. was so hands off with them. Mm. He, he had them for kittens, but he was so hands off. He was so, he, he was so adamant that he didn't want to interfere with them that yeah, they yeah. were so, they weren't used to being handled. They caught they came and sit on his lap when they wanted oh, yeah. to, but he would never, he, he gave them too much autonomy in the sense that it was actually not, it ended up being not as camp compassionate because, because they weren't handled. They, he couldn't get them to the vets and things like that. Exactly, and, exactly. And I think that um, uh, in, this, in, in that sense, the same applies to whether, you know, in terms of upbringing and things like that, is that you've got to think about, yeah, the reality is in the world we live in, you need to be able to reason with people and some, with, and when animals. you're bringing up children to be <laughs> able to say, and adults, yeah, but with children to be able to say, yeah, if there's a chance, I'll give you a choice. But right now, there's no choice because we're going to be late if we don't, or that's right. you know, you're in danger if we don't. You've got to be able, as that's part of the, whether it be animals or children or whatever, you know, whatever you're doing, autonomy is. Um, you've got to have a sense of autonomy, but at the same time, you've also got to be able to have that understanding that part of your safety, your you know, you need to choose part of your autonomy is that you sometimes you need to trust somebody else. That's right. That's right. Um, so trust is crucial. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that, that's where, that's that's where having a structure in your schools, to bring it back to schools, yeah. is that you have to develop a structure that develops trust amongst people. And this yeah. is where the mainstream schooling tends to fall down. Yeah. And, and where teachers do things they don't realize are problematic. And this is why it's so inconsistent mm -hmm. in mainstream schools is that the the quality of a of an of a, any given classroom is is super different. Every classroom within a school is mm -hmm. going to be very different because 
the hazards of that power of mm -hmm. the of the teacher is is built on trust is that oh, there's the no teacher... integrity if there's no integrity children pick up on lack of integrity <clears throat> just like that I, i'm not i'm not even talking they, about integrity no yeah but just it, just it, like you know being a word you know sort of that this person this person will keep you safe no they can't well or whatever you know they're just not you, you, children they pick up on that so quickly Right. So, so I would say it's not integrity because even the most uh, teachers who intend the best, you know, like they may have great intentions and they may yeah. be doing their best to fulfill those intentions. But when the power structure is is created in such a way that, that the yeah. teacher's ability to build to trust can be yeah. undermined by other people, mm. other people yeah. in the same classroom yeah. can yeah. undermine yeah. their thing. So it's not but their integrity. But that's what I mean by integrity. Well, it's not theirs, it's not theirs, but it is a kind of integrity in the sense that it's, um, if they say this is what's going to happen, or this is this, you know, this is, I promise this and that. And then a week later they say, I'm sorry, but Miss, Miss so-and-so says, no, that's not allowed. And right. we've got to right. follow the rules and so on like that. And then quite quickly, the, 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 sort, of, the sort of level of resignation Exactly, exactly. It's just, you know, I noticed this, I know I was teaching um, uh, first graders sort of, um, not first, it's like a secondary, first first year of secondary school um, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, as part of my teacher training. And the, the level of resignation and cynicism um, was, and it was, and I just thought there's nothing I can do about that. That's, they, they, right, right. they know exactly how the system works and they're going to play the system and they're going to do exactly it's not that they can't. In that, in that sense, it's easy. They they know that this is there's absolute power, and they have to just do as they're told. That's right. Um, That's right. But there's no joy. There's no. Um, as soon as you try and introduce, oh, let's do something that you want to do, they're like, what do you want me to say? Yeah, yeah. Manipulate them. They feel manipulated by it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. so, so I was going to bring up the the example of um, uh, there's a teacher down in Los Angeles uh, who wrote a, a best selling book. Uh, teach like your hair's on fire. Rafe Esquith, that's who it is. Um, <laughs> is he was a he was a teacher uh, of I think it was second grade or fourth grade, I, probably fourth grade. I don't remember exactly. Anyway, he taught for for decades. Um, wrote a best selling book, you know. But he learned how he learned what his he became very conversant in in what he could do. So he he developed and he became he also there was a film made about about one of his classes that's before the book or before after the, before the book I believe that led to the book anyway um, but he taught like Shakespeare to second graders you know like yeah. like he was really doing stuff and the kids were passionate and it's really interesting because the situation he was in he was able to do some amazing stuff however even he in his book said you can't reach everybody. Now you can't reach everybody because they're just assigned to his class, and and so he does the best he can. But even he, who's a genius level mm -hmm. like teacher, if you don't and, want to learn Shakespeare, you yeah, don't want to learn you Shakespeare. Make you know, you can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So he always was attuned. So so speaking to, mm -hmm. specifically to your integrity point is like he had integrity because he was able to develop the integrity of knowing mm -hmm. how the system works so thoroughly so he knew what he could do and what he couldn't but do. But he, so he... he didn't he didn't like it as long as he as long as you don't lie to as long as you don't say stuff to kids that they know to be um not consistent if, if, it, if it sounds like it makes right. sense like if he says you know like i love this i'm good at teaching it um if you're not interested that's fine but you know right. we've right. got to do this then you're being straightforward with them. There's right, no, exactly. there's no, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think your point about integrity is correct. Um, and so, and so the, but you have to understand integrity in terms of both personal and organizational alignment. So yeah. Rafe was able to align himself with the system and do yeah. a great job. But even yeah. he said, I can't reach everybody. And that's an organizational problem. That's not his problem. Mm. He didn't create but, but it. In that sense, is there any is there any, is there necessarily anything wrong with having you don't you don't necessarily have to get a hundred you know if it, in that context it's not you know if you're not interested you're not interested it's not important even if someone gets halfway through the class and then changes their mind you know that isn't right, the right. issue it's um you know it's a sort of separate thing in that sense like everyone agrees no matter who in terms of education. Um, that high expectations 
are a good thing. Right. Exactly. But how that Everybody how knows. that gets how that gets manifested is another matter. But high expectations Truly. do something. But um, if you use fear to induce your high expectations and lies and so on like that, it will go wrong. Exactly. <laughs> or whatever. Exactly. It's, it's obviously that, more complicated than that, but yeah. Well, yeah. But, but it, it, it's, to use more precise language of psychology, is like, yeah, if you bring into that situation uh, a relation, if you develop a relationship that then breaks trust, you've destroyed the relationship. You've destroyed yeah. a true need. You've undermined a need that that person has. And so, and yeah. so the problem in Rafe's situation is that, is that, if the child says, hey, I'm not interested in Shakespeare, there's nowhere their class, they can't leave the classroom and go somewhere else yeah. where they're going to be able to invest their time and energy in a better way. Yeah. They don't have the option. And that's the problem. It's not race yeah. problem. Yeah. It's, no, the, exactly. it's the yeah. school that he bought yeah. into it's, when yeah, he was it's, hired it's there. The hours wasted. It's the hours wasted in school going through the motions because that's where you have to be. That is, right. you know, This right. is why you know, I didn't attend... Um, most of my secondary school, I didn't go. Um, mm -hmm. I pretended I had music lessons, um, <laughs> and I still passed. I still passed all of the exams right, um, right. at that point for that level. I still passed up my O levels, my CSC. There was O levels and CSCs at the time, um, only just in a sense. But I still passed them, even though I didn't right. go to most of the lessons. And that was before the internet. And I think mm -hmm. even nowadays, with the internet, everything else that it's even less necessary to spend, it's even more pointless to spend hours and hours in class being blah, 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 and having to manage all of the horrible sensory overload that you get with 30 children in the classroom. Right, right, it's completely, right. It's completely unnecessary. And in fact, it's, it's actually, you know, I would say more than unnecessary. I think it's actually quite cruel. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, yeah. Then, but what, exactly you know, the sense, what can we... Being able to give giving giving young people the opportunity to go somewhere where they can have autonomy and space and relatedness and the chance to um, do that is what that's why we do it in a sense that's what we, we're after and exactly. to give more you know to give as many people as that's possible we can't expect everybody to do it to go back to the idea um, no matter how we feel about it we're never going to be able to get the whole world to agree with us you know. Well, yeah, that's true. But, uh, but but I think that there the my work is really directed to bringing the scientific language to yeah. uh, more precisely understand um, what that situation of schooling is, and and yeah. and I want to bring that to my university. I'm going I'm, I'm going through your book, and when right, right. this is my my sort of my plan is to get my degree, and I want to do a master's, and I keep going because I enjoy doing mm -hmm. that. I'm doing it because I enjoy it, but. But it's a sense I'm coming for the education system. I want to be able exactly. to have, I want to find this type of, you know, rigorous peer reviewed academic research that shows that um, our guts are right in the sense that um, autonomy does matter. Right. And right. agency. And that, that, that and evidence is already there. Read the yeah. footnotes in the book. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, <laughs> we, we've got and, the proof. We've just got to bring it out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so what I've discovered is that, that the, the challenge is is not the people in the system; it is the system itself. It's that there's it's built on assumptions and organizational forms that contradict what we've discovered about autonomy. Mm. Um, I call it superstition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's, you can it's use that term. Superstition. It's no different to the to the way that religion used to world run the world in a sense. Right, and 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 uh, so yeah. my training in psychology is, uh, you know, I, I have a behavioral background. Um, mm. My and, and so superstition in that sense is is about so when when you're training a pigeon um, to press a lever, and if you accidentally get it to turn left every time before it presses the lever, the the left turn is a superstition. It's yeah. an extraneous behavior that, that occurs and reoccurs. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the, the bird self-reinforces that before it gets the true reinforcement of the, the, the pellet from the lever press. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so superstition in both, in, in a sense of just, there's something unnecessary. And maybe in, in the case of, of, of the way it, schools are currently working in the mainstream is counterproductive to mm. what's truly educative. And then this is the, the focus of my new book, is to be more precise and clear 
about what that means. What I mean by uh, there, there's something counterproductive in the way things are organized. Mm -hmm. So, so thinking about Rafe Esquith, and and you know, he actually eventually uh, was was drummed out of the system, as happens to all, every teacher that I know of that has had a movie made about them or had a truly best-selling book, has been essentially rejected by the system. Um, yeah. There may be well, some you exceptions, you, but you still. To, yeah, if you attempt to change it, the system goes, we don't want to be changed, thank you very much. Yes, exactly. Um, <clears throat> so the, mm. the, uh, the guy who, made, who Stand and Deliver was made about had that happen. Uh, Freedom Riders, uh, which you know, mm. it was also in L.A. district. Uh, anyway, you, you, there's a litany of, of folks who've been driven out. The reason Absolutely. they've been driven reason, out. And there's, there's some case studies of that in, in this book as well from um, uh, Jerry Mintz about um, right. in New York. But um, they had these great programs that were introduced, uh, but then you think that they should be, they would have gone further, but they don't, yeah. Right, right. And, yeah. so, and so I think now we have, we can bring a more precise language to understanding what's going on. And I think part of that is, yes, the, the crucial psychological pieces are there, but what's actually the problem is not the psychological stuff, it's the organizational or sociological yeah. patterns. Um, and, and that's where, um, uh, you know, we need to take it to a different level mm -hmm. of understanding and say, okay, what are the organizational dynamics that need to be changed? And, and that's where, at the end of the book you're reading, Schooling for mm -hmm. Holistic Equity for, my audi for the audience, um, is, is, yep. is using a, a resolution process to, to be more precise <laughs> about uh, what, what's going on. What's going to wake you up, think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, so, so that's where, you know, yeah. Yeah, I'm promoting my stuff now, uh, but, but, but yeah. so let's finish up. This is actually one of the, you know, we, we've gone longer than yeah. usual. So it's very fun. I appreciate it. Uh, getting it's, the juices it's, flowing. It's, it's really great. interesting. This, this is the problem. I can talk for England. Um, I'm talking for the Netherlands today. But, um, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so, so, so if people wanted to find more about the school where you're at now, uh, you're, yeah. So you're in teacher training, and you're you may be. Are 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 you figuring to continue in the Netherlands, or are you? I mean, that's where your family yeah. is. So. Um, well, yeah. I think um, yeah, I've got teenagers, so it will be, um, for a couple of years, I'm probably going to be still here. But um, certainly, um, my my sort of uh, I have a sort of a semi plan to basically finish this, finish my masters, um, and maybe do a little bit of travelling with teaching at some mm. point, um, and. Uh, but um, my short-term plan at the moment is I've just started, a, um, I'm doing a midsummer night stream with my students at the Rounder. We're going to do a play for if we're in the summer. Neat. And um, I just, I was looking up teacher resources um, for, uh, to, you know, because obviously you can, there's lots of different things, like on the RSC website, they've got lots of good teacher resources. And oh, they're doing they're doing a production in London, so I'm going to see about getting the, getting the students to London in the spring, maybe. Nice, okay. nice. Yeah, field yeah, trip. Very cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So, so if they want, if if our audience wants to find out more about the the school in particular, um, yeah. how would they yeah. look it up? Um, the Ramta is um, uh, uh, presumably there'll be some details. Uh, I can send a link have a link below, so yeah. that it be on the thing. Yeah, um, the Ramta Hoost is the uh, point now or point um, dot now. That's it. <laughs> Can't speak English anymore. Um, is the website, um, and uh, I think there is also a Democratic Schools in the Netherlands website. I think basically mm. Google Democratic Schools. I think there are about a dozen or so slightly more Democratic Schools in the Netherlands. It's quite nice. a lot, relatively speaking. Yes, yes. Um, the Ramte is the biggest in the Netherlands, and now the oldest as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the website has a lot of really interesting um, resources and links to resources. They've done a lot of films and some books um, on democratic education. There's um, Roots, the, one of the owners actually has a book out as well. Yeah. It was one of the, one of the three books at the IDEC. Is the yeah. um, How to Create an Oasis for Development, and this yes. is uh, um, direct um, from. This is basically ideas and stories from the school. Yeah, um, yeah, but there's other books that the Rounder have brought out as well. But yeah, there's if you go to the website, there are there's all there's, there's all kinds of links to films um, that they've made. They did a really interesting film 
where they took five students who had started at the school mm. pretty much when it opened and they left a few years ago now but they did a documentary of their life basically from five to oh, wow. becoming adults Nice, um, nice. They've done some great stuff like that. So, um, if if anyone's interested in, um, you know, in a sense, looking at the viability and the long term sustainability for children, there's a lot of good evidence there. Right on, right on. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Christine. I think we will yeah. uh, call it a, call it good there. Um, appreciate it, and uh, see you again next time. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Don. All um, right. See you. I hope speak soon. Yes.